what seemed to make sense to us all is for me to introduce you to the exhibition very quickly and then proceed to the discussion with William. Um, William Kentridge is one of the most uh, varied of artists. He, his background reflects that. He studied theater. He helped found the puppet theater in Johannesburg. He produced many theatrical productions as well as having studied acting. Um, and along with all that, he studied the graphic arts. And so his work reflects who he is as a person. This incredibly varied background appears in the exhibition. Uh, when, we were when we were thinking about how to organize the exhibition, we decided that one way to span the career but not to include every sort of left turn in the story of his life, was to focus on themes. And so the exhibition is organized around five themes in which you see groups of two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects as well as films, films and theatrical pieces. So with that ever so brief introduction, uh, we can now turn to uh, our conversation. Um, what I want to begin with is what is, to me, always the obvious thing about the appreciation of William's work. For so many people who came to know the art of William Kentridge starting about 10, 12 years ago, uh, you were really one of the great poets of South Africa along with David Rosenblatt and uh, Nadine Gordoner and others. Um, as such, uh, in living in the pressure cooker of South Africa, was it an opportunity or was it a burden to turn to South Africa as your primary subject matter? Well, thank you. Very happy to be here, and it's very nice to start the conversation. It's not something that one turns to. It wasn't a decision, I'm in my studio, what should I start looking at? That's what was all around. That was the bedrock. That was the, so living in South Africa was obviously the, not the raw material, but the, the whole context in which everything happened. So it would have been, in a sense, very unnatural not to have been aware of what was happening in South Africa. It wasn't done as a conscious decision. Um, I suppose it would have been a conscious decision to say, as many artists in South Africa do say, I'm going to be interested in landscape or still life. But I suspect even then, if one's working just with landscape or still life or any other genre, it's very difficult to escape who you are. Because in the end, however you do it, the work always reflects you in, to a greater or lesser extent. Do you think, well, let me start differently. Um, I've sometimes been struck by groups of artists who found themselves at work in very complicated times and places. I think of the German artists at the time of the two Germanies. And uh, do you think in effect it was an opportunity as an artist? Obviously not an opportunity to witness what you witness, but no, there's no, there's no doubt that. I mean, the, the famous Chinese curse of may you live in interesting times uh, is an opportunity for, for artists. Um, I think that what happens is that contradictions and ambiguities which are there in the world, wherever you are, in however a peaceful situation, get heightened and made clearer and they are impossible to avoid. So it's not as if you're revealing a different world to other worlds but the circumstances of the politics of the society make all those ruptures and cracks that much, more, that much clearer, that much more obvious. So in a way, the subject matter gets pushed towards you. There's less excavation that needs to be done, or else there are more invitations to excavations and investigations. Um, so for an, I think for, it's much more difficult now, for example, for young artists starting in South Africa to find where to begin for a number of reasons. I mean, one of them was when I was started working as a student and for the first 10 years or so that I was working, 
in the height of apartheid leading up to 1990 when there was the transformation in South Africa, the release of Nelson Mandela, the unbanning of political organizations and the trans transition to democracy. In the 70s and 80s when I was starting, there was a stronger and stronger cultural boycott of South Africa. You know, South African artists weren't invited abroad, curators didn't come from uh, foreign institutions to look what was happening in South Africa. And what that meant is that there was never an expectation that the work one was doing would be part of an international conversation. And I'm sure it's something that is in all places that are at the edge of what are perceived as the centers, whether it's Paris or Berlin or New York, which I'm sure would be the case in Australia here too, that there's a kind of a self-imposed provincial pressure of what is being done elsewhere, what is in the art magazines, what's in art forum, what's in art in America. Because there was no expectation of any work ever being in those forums, on those magazines, in those exhibitions, in those museums, it took away all that pressure of what ought I to be doing, to be seen, to be noticed. And that is a kind of a terrifying pressure that sits on, particularly when you start off as an artist. You know, what do I need to do? What should I be doing? Oh my God, I see everybody's writing about this work. I'd better do work that's like Bruce Nauman, or I'd better do work that's like Joseph Boyce. I'd better work with honey, something like that, um, or wax or felt. So it was, because there was no expectation of that, it meant I could say, well, I'm working with these quite conservative charcoal figurative drawings, and then I started making these films, but completely without expectation that they would be part of that conversation. And then when apartheid ended, and in the mid-1990s, curators came to South Africa to look at what was being done there when we had two, two biennales in Johannesburg, the work had kind of found its own rhythm, it had found its own way of the, the, the films had established their own technique, their own material, and then they were kind of accepted in their own terms. So in retrospect, that was an enormous blessing. I'm sure if I'd been, you know, in, in a later stage, it would have been much more difficult to ignore what were mainstream trends of art making and art practice in other parts of the world. You've often been called a, quote, political artist, which is... Uh, a far more complicated term than I think most people, the way most people use it. Do you identify with that? I do, but in an inverted way. When normally when you think of political art, one thinks of clear slogans, messages, um, very clear programs of thought and action, which are then exemplified in a painting, in a poster, in a mural, in some specific form. And when I started as an artist, it was very much with this kind of way of working, with a very kind of, I suppose, Leninist approach to art. What is to be done? What are the images needed in the world? What does a trade union shop steward need to see to understand the world better? And for the first few years, that's very clearly how I worked. And then it came to a complete halt, because I discovered I kept on trying to imagine what other people thought or what other people understood and I could get it completely wrong. It was impossible to anticipate what someone would pick up or not. Or you, what image, more than that, what image you thought you were making and what somebody else saw in it once it was made. So you would think you were making an image, this is an image about liberation and breaking chains, and what people would receive would be a kind of desperate need to be accepted, seen in the work, in the programmatic nature of the work. So in a way, it was only when that stopped being the case. I stopped making art for several years. And when I came back to it, it was with the idea that it simply had to work for myself. Images I was interested in without necessarily understanding why. Certainly not understanding or having a sense of the need for images in the world or what they would mean to someone else. And in fact, that's when all the work that's in the exhibition here began. And then I discovered that, in fact, it was still very connected to the political and social world of Johannesburg, but in a different way. In a way in which uncertainty uh, unambigu and ambiguity and um, uncertain endings were part both of the work, but also part of my understanding of, what's, of how the world operated, how South Africa operated. That all claims to clarity and certainty were simply authoritarian claims that always needed either a, 
a gun or a loud voice to back them up, but weren't in fact how the world worked. And that the more ambiguous the films became, the less certain they became, the greater space there was for uncertainty in the structure of making of the films, in the very strategies of making them, the closer in a way they could get to what South Africa felt like to me. Again, not speaking on behalf of a universal idea of South Africa, but a very particular viewpoint. So there is a pol politics in them, but it's, and it's a polemical politics about the need for ambiguity and uncertainty and against certainty in the work itself, but by extension into an understanding of, of the world. So that's a political position, as it were? I think it is. I think mm -hmm. it is. I mean, it's not a helpful political position. <laughs> it doesn't get things done, but I think it's a... Uh, I, I do think I... I mean, I'm trying to work out, do I come to that position because it coincides with the work I happen to have made and it reinforces the, the work. But if I think it, I, I think it is as close as I could get to a position. I was um, recently reading a novel by Nadine Gordimer and um, it was it sort of introduced an idea I had never thought about regarding you and I, I wanted to ask you about it. Uh, William comes from a very notable family of South Africa, uh, lawyers and judges of several generations. Uh, during the time of apartheid, did you ever fear for your safety? No, I didn't. I mean, there were, there were lawyers who were harassed and some who were imprisoned. Um, and there may have been a threat against my father, but I never sensed it as a child. I mean, there were certain families I knew where they lived, where parents were arrested or detained and people had a kind of underground existence as well, or at any rate lived with that fear and anxiety. And it was certainly not anything I can remember from my childhood. It may have been blocked from me, but I don't think so. I think South Africa was always a strange, it was very different to Eastern Europe. It was a different kind of, it was not a totalitarian state, it was a police state, but with a difference that, in its own terms, it needed to believe that it was part of the West. And so there were always gaps within its control for things to happen, for law to be practiced. Terrible judges appointed, but nonetheless important victories and important defeats won by, uh, by lawyers practicing within this insane system. So it was and within the art world also, within the visual arts, within novels, there were some works that were banned. A lot of s television was very tightly controlled. Theater was slightly controlled. Novels were also occasionally controlled. The visual arts almost never. They were seen as so marginal that it was not part of the real purview. There was one artist whose work was banned in South Africa, and that was because he drew, he drew an image of Jesus Christ wearing a Christmas hat. And this was seen to be blasphemous. And my films, the earliest of the animated films I remember was submitted to the censorship board um, for approval before it could be screened in public. And it came back, and in South Africa, things would either be banned because they were sexually explicit or because they were left-wing in politics. So you would have every week a list of banned items which would um, range from new arguments on agrarian, peasant agrarian revolution in Chile, and schoolgirls on heat would be, the two, <laughs> would be the kind of combined list that would come out every, every week. And the film came back from the censorship board with the message that um, the film contains uh, scenes of intercourse and fellatio, however they are sufficiently badly drawn as not to cause offense. <laughs> and the films were, were shown. So they weren't banned. They weren't banned. <laughs> your stone, your style of Stone Age animation worked. <laughs> yes. Can you talk a little bit about your decision to stay in South Africa, even as your family left and so many friends left? And I think there are three. There were three factors. The first was kind of an inertia. That's where I was. And in the absence of a strong push or pull in either direction, that's where I stayed. And there were other very specific things. Um, 
family roots in South Africa in the sense of my wife, Anne, who in fact is Australian, came to South Africa many years ago. Was By the time I was working, an artist was practicing as a doctor in South Africa, and there were very strong and cogent causes in terms of patient needs and medical needs in the country to be in South Africa. And that one sense took part of the impulse. There was a very strong route back. Then there was a very strong connection with different collaborators that I've worked with over the years, the editor, composers, uh, actors. So there were work, strong work connections in terms of how the work was made. And thirdly, there was a sense that I kind of knew what I was doing, who I was in South Africa. You know, however, whatever, however one wanted to define that, there was a sense of connection to roots of the history of the city, to art making in South Africa, to the relationship of the weight of European and American art making to being on the edge of, the, uh, of that world. Uh, that still feel a very strong way and pressure to, to keep working. So without ascribing different weights to these different elements, it's, it's never felt essential or necessary to feel one had to leave South Africa. In the 1980s, I think it was very different. In the mid-1980s, I took a portfolio of drawings to New York to try to get them seen. And I thought, well, the big problem would be that I'm a white South African, and so people will just not show me the door. But there were three, there were three problems then. The, the least important was that I was a white South African. The second more important problem was that I made drawings and not oil paintings. But the biggest problem for all the galleries there was that I didn't live in New York. They said in the term, which is so disgusting but still used in America, as well, and I suppose, yeah, in New York particularly, as if it is the feudal baronial manner that one has to come and pay your dues, like a serf that has to come and bring its tithe and give it to the lord of the manor. And when one had paid one's dues, one would be allowed into the hallowed halls of New York. So I think that also really repulsed me and pushed me away. And then things changed, and by the 1990s, it was possible to say, well, I will, be an, I will work, and I will try to have my work seen not only in Johannesburg, but in other venues at all. And in fact, it has been, and is possible, for not just for me, but for many, many artists now, not to feel that to be an artist, you have to take your pots and pans to Paris or Berlin. When um, the TRC hearings were over, and uh, basically the Ubu theme was over for you. What was life like? I mean, eventually, very, not long after, you produced the series of the Melies films having to do with yourself in the studio, but I'm curious what you were thinking about in terms of what subject matter came next? I'm sure it was an evolution rather than a one day this, another day that, but I'm just curious your state of mind. Just to, in case people aren't completely familiar, after the transition to democracy in 1990 and our first elections in 1994, part of the negotiations of the transition in South Africa was the agreement to set up a commission that would look at human rights abuses under apartheid called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission which worked with a kind of Faustian pact that one would sacrifice justice for truth. So there would not be prosecutions like the Nuremberg trials of people who had committed atrocities, but rather there would be a double investigation or double set of evidences given. People who had suffered under apartheid would give evidence of what had happened to them or to members of their family. And at the same time, people who had perpetrated terrible acts, would give evidence, give evidence about these acts. And the way of persuading people to give this evidence, which was about terrible things they themselves had done, was to offer immunity from prosecution and amnesty. So you had this extreme irony that the more and more terrible things that people had done, this murder, this torture, this blowing up of a body, the sending of a letter bomb to a mother and child, as the details came out, so the person who had did, done this would get closer and closer to getting immunity and amnesty from these events, for these <coughs> events. 
And it was a calculated decision, knowing that this was most probably the only way that people would be persuaded, the threat of being prosecuted if they didn't do it, and the offer of amnesty if they did admit what had happened. And for the first months, only victims gave evidence, people who had suffered. But gradually, bit by bit, and then in a huge flood, the perpetrators came forward and gave evidence. Obviously, it multiplied because as one person gave evidence, you would name his colleagues who had also done it, who then would have to give their evidence in order to be safe from prosecution. So although justice was not reached, we did certainly find out a huge amount about the details of our recent history. And it's, it was kind of remarkable. It sort of was an, an airing of what had happened that hasn't really ever happened in Paris, in France, say, with regard to the collaboration during the Second World War or in Lithuania or in Holland. Um, and it's certainly an imperfect, in terms of reconciliation, it's a completely imperfect process. Many people still feel very cheated and aggrieved, as one can, as they should. Um, but after that project was done, there was a period in which, as you say, I was the next big project had to do with life in the studio. It coincided with some months that I spent in New York when I was thinking about Bruce Nauman and his early films and then came to see the films of Georges Méliès for the first time. Um, at the time, it didn't feel like, oh, well, now I've stopped thinking about South Africa, I'm just thinking about the studio. But in retrospect, it was. It was a kind of period of saying it's very hard to now make sense of what the new contradictions and conflicts in South Africa are. And since then, there is work that goes back very specifically to Johannesburg and to South Africa. But it was a time of distancing. Being in New York at that period uh, helped lay the groundwork, I suppose, for that. I mean, you were away from South Africa? I was, a, I was away, but I don't <coughs> think that's the... I think, I mean, work often starts in very unexpected ways, in the sense that something that you think is going to be a two-day quick drawing or sketch suddenly becomes the groundwork for something that's going to take three years to finally work through. So these, the series of Melia's films initially came because on the new video camera that I'd bought, it, you know, a little handy cam, it had a reverse function. So you could film something and watch it going, playing itself backwards, which you obviously couldn't do with 16 millimeter film very easily until it was edited. But here you could film something and immediately watch it being played in in reverse, and that started a whole series of explorations as to what the world became if one could reverse time. Uh, and it's a kind of a theme that I'm still intrigued by, what, what, what reversal means, what inversion means. Um, so the, the film started from that and then became a series of looking at very simple cinematic techniques such as similar to those that Georges Méliès had used. It also became, I think, the first time you're explicitly in the work. I mean, you're in the work all the time. Yes, I think there's, I mean, there was, that certainly came from looking at the Bruce Nauman films. I don't even know, in the early 60s, just when video cameras started being manageable and uh, domesticated and didn't have to be in a huge studio, Bruce Nauman made a series of fantastic, enigmatic films, simply of him walking around the studio, contraposter, shaking his hips from side to side. Um, and what they reminded, what they struck me was that it was a, another version of performances of what it was to be an artist. And if one thinks back, um, in which the studio becomes a, a stage or a canvas, and the artist moving in it becomes a kind of brush moving through. If one thinks of the other great films of artists that worked, one thinks of um, the Jackson Pollock films in which he, he himself is like the brush moving over the canvas, moving and shifting his way across the canvas, which is another film version of the artist in his studio. Before that, you have those wonderful, strange paintings taken, uh, films taken of Picasso through glass, where you see him painting through the glass. And in a way, if you want to think further back, you can think of the paintings of Courbet in the studio with his model, where the studio becomes a, a sort of stage for a performance, both a canvas and a stage. 
And the Méliès films, I was thinking of it both ways, of them as a kind of drawing, sometimes a drawing within a drawing, performing the act of drawing, but very much um, the studio somewhere between a canvas and a stage for a performance to happen in it and on it. And the Méliès, the Méliès films were made, with, were made very simply. Georges Méliès would paint his backdrops in his studio, and then he would perform and act the stories in front of his own painted backdrops. And so some of the films that I did involved a painted backdrop, drawing the scenery in front of which the simple films would happen. And sometimes that painted backdrop became, as it were, a drawing of the studio in the studio. So there would be a real stepladder, and then in certain scenes there would be a simple drawing of the stepladder, the same scale as the three-dimensional stepladder. So they worked between performing on a drawing, making a drawing, and in front of a drawing. I think for me, that series, uh, the Malleus films, uh, was the start of your kind of unleashing your comic side because they're really so funny so often. And uh, you have these funny walks going on that are a little like a cross between Charlie Chaplin and Groucho Marx, it seems. And uh, I mean, with the early animated films, I kept on hoping I was doing a comedy, and then people would look, them and t look at them and tell me no, they had not. <laughs> with these films, I thought I was doing straight, simple movements in front of the camera, and people told me no, in fact, they're ridiculous. <laughs> so, so. I mean, some of them, the, the, the ridiculousness comes from the technique itself, because I would be working with a 35 millimeter camera with a motor designed for single frame, shooting one frame at a time. Normally when a movie camera runs, it shoots 24 frames every second. And you play it back at, on a projector, and something that took a second to do takes a second to project. But with this camera, which could only take single frame, one frame at a time, it didn't have a motor that could run at a normal time, you would shoot a frame and shoot a frame, so it would shoot one frame every second. So if you wanted your hand to take one second to do that action with this camera, you'd have to film it here, and then film it there, and film it, and film it. So it would take 24 seconds of filming for when you project it for it to take one second to pass, which is fine if you're just moving your finger. But when you're trying to walk across the studio and make it seem that you're walking at normal speed, but in fact your discipline is you have to walk at 1 24th, of normal speed. You have to be a fabulous dancer to be able <laughs> to do that well. And so I was simply trying my hardest to walk smoothly and slowly, but it of necessity became imperfect. As the audience will see, um, maybe the high point of the exhibition, and the exhibition has so many high points, really, it's a thrilling experience. But maybe the high point of the exhibition is to be in the room with the three pieces having to do with uh, Mozart's magic flute. And um, of course the music of Mozart is gripping beyond belief, but one of the pieces in that room is called Black Box, in which much of the music was uh, performed by Hereran performers from Namibia. Uh, it seems to me that I myself didn't spend enough time writing about the following subject, but I don't think anybody really has, and yet it's hitting one in the face. Uh, the music is so powerful in your work. And it might be interesting if you could talk a little bit about your collaborations with Philip Miller, with the singers, how you involve them, not to speak of Mozart, who was an implied I mean, collaborator, I guess. <laughs> um, well, maybe the best way to talk that is to describe this project, the evolution of magic flute. So in the... In the room there are three pieces, one of which is a blackboard on which is projected images that accompany the overture of the magic flute, done straight. There's a miniature theater in which there are extracts with projections of from Mozart's opera, uh, 
with a recording, I think, from the late 1990s. And on the other side of the room is a miniature theatre, um, an automaton, mechanised object that perform in the small theatre, which perform a piece which is a reflection on the magic flute. And it's a reflection on the magic flute, so we'll first go on a diversionary route to explain what the reflection means. The Magic Flute is an Enlightenment opera. It's written by Mozart in 1791, and it's about light dispelling the darkness of superstition and ignorance. In that, the, that the opera, as epitomizing the Enlightenment, obviously is a reference back to Plato's myth of the cave, where the philosopher has to come back and take people out of darkness into light. So light becomes the same as knowledge and truth. Darkness the same as ignorance, superstition, uh, which obviously becomes a colonial metaphor in the 19th, 18th and 19th and 20th centuries of what it was to go into Africa to bring light to the dark continent, all of that. So there is a line, there's a line of this metaphor of lightness and dark going through a lot of the exhibition, but through this particular work. And I was thinking about the Enlightenment in 1791 when Mozart wrote it, when you could have the character of Zoroastro who embodied the wise philosopher who was going to bring light to darkness, to dispel the darkness. And thinking about the dangers of these wise philosophers in the history since Mozart to now. The philosopher is someone in the terms of Plato and in terms of Mozart who combines a certainty of knowledge and wisdom together with the monopoly of force. So Sarastro both has knowledge, but he also has whatever power he needs to accompany his act of enlightenment. And thinking of all the disastrous tyrants that have done such damage in the last 200 years, who would all have described themselves as Plato's philosopher king or as Sarastro, people who had great knowledge and were going to help everyone else, whether it's Robespierre at the time that Mozart was writing, in which the terror would have been described in the same terms as Plato's philosopher taking people from ignorance to the rationality of the Enlightenment, or whether it would have been Lenin and his party taking people into the truth of the proletariat by whatever means necessary, or the Americans in Vietnam saying they were going to, if forced by necessary, show the best way of the American way of life and democracy, or Pol Pot in Cambodia. This is all part of the same trajectory, the same danger of combining <coughs> certainty and a monopoly of violence. A long way of saying that I was interested in thinking about the character of Sarastra, the central, one of the central characters in the magic flute, and thinking what is the underbelly, what is the shadow of the enlightenment that is there. And started working with the composer Philip Miller, saying, well, let's listen to the music in a different way. Instead of the beautiful, reassuring voice of Sarastra, singing his aria about, in these halls there is no vengeance, there's only brotherly love, which in fact was taken from a recording done by Thomas Beecham in Berlin in 1937. And to think, what is the voice of Sarastro singing, in these halls there is only brotherly love, there is no vengeance taken. What that song meant in the swastika bedecked Staats opera of Berlin in 1937 gave a shock of thinking, well, what in fact is underneath a lot of this. And so Sarastro's aria, we said, well, let's see what happens if instead of it's a voice, it's a brass band that is playing it. And you discover that this wonderfully reassuring voice of Sarastro, in fact, is a very simple march in a different orchestration becomes quite a terrifyingly aggressive march. And so a lot of the music of the magic flute in this automaton theater was transposed, fragments taken, stretched, taken apart, put together with uh, Herrera music, the th sorry, the, the, the historical setting for the automaton, the automatic theater, black box, was the other end of the German Enlightenment, Ger German colonialism in 1904 when there was the first German genocide of the last century, when the Herrera population was reduced by 80% uh, through the actions of the Germans order of annihilation when they came to stop a rebellion in what was then German Southeast Africa. So that the music, in a way, that the logic of the transformation of the music had to do with this long other story I've been going on about rethinking about the Enlightenment and the magic flute in the light of the post-history of the opera. Sorry, that was a very long way of answering that question. <laughs>
Well, I was also interested in hearing you describe your work with Philip Miller, and do you uh, give him this kind of background and hope he comes back with something that you'll like? Or no, how does there, I mean, the work with Philip, and he's a composer in Johannesburg that I've worked with for close on 20 years, has to do with an ongoing, as each project evolves, there are a series of conversations so that when there is three minutes of animation done, say two months into a year's project, I'll show him the first two or three minutes of a film and we'll then listen to many, many different pieces of music, some music that he's written for other, for other projects, old music, music by other composers, trying to find what does, how does the different pieces of music get us to see the images differently. And with the black box, I'd said to him when I was interested in this image of, or the music of Sarastro, and what could it become? And he said, well, I've got a program on my computer where you can hit the key and it will take whatever line of music you've put in and play it as a brass band or play it as a Dixieland jazz band or as a barbershop quartet. And we listened to kind of different transpositions, crude transpos transpositions of a computer and found extraordinary different things. So it's always about a listening while we are watching what is mm -hmm. happening and it's a it's about a an openness to what arrives from the music and what the music suggests in its most extreme form in one case in a film called um a trio of films breathe dissolve um breathe dissolve return it had to do with i was writing we needed some music that could be played while an orchestra was tuning up so in other words, it had to be the sound of kind of chaos every now and then finding order but disintegrating again into chaos the way an orchestra tunes. And I said one of the things I knew that was going to be happening on stage after the film had been projected, it was a film to be projected on a fire curtain of an opera house before a performance. As soon as the performance started, the music and the projections were over, but it was an invitation to project more or less the scale on the fire curtain of the opera house in, in Venice. And he said, well, what music are they playing? I said, well, I think they're doing Yanis Kiki is the opera they're doing. So he said, well, let me see if I can find some music from that. And he phoned a friend who was a singer and said, did she know any music from Yanis Kiki? And she said, yes, yes, she knew. There's one aria that she used in auditions. And he said, well, could he sing it to her? Could he come and sing it to her in the studio? And she said, well, the trouble is she was in Cape Town and he was in Johannesburg. And he said, well, just sing it to me over the phone. So she started singing it over the cell phone. He said, hang on, hang on, hang on. And he got his cell phone and put it on speakerphone and his tape recorder. And then he put his cell phone and the tape recorder on the piano. And he played the piano accompaniment. And she sang the aria on her cell phone in Cape Town. So she could hear the piano. And he could hear through the speakerphone her singing. And the tape recorder picked them both up. And it became a kind of astonishing version of the song. Part of it sounds like a 1920s recording, the same kind of quality. And it was strong enough for that strange comment to say, all right, bring her, let's all meet in Johannesburg. And we then re-recorded it with Philip in one room in my house at the piano. And Pretty Yende with me in the studio with her singing again into the cell phone and me filming her in the cell phone. And so that was kind of a chance openness to what arrived on his, which he came and played me in the studio saying, well, this is an idea. I don't think we're going to use it, but listen how interesting the sounds. And then that, in fact, determined the whole piece of music we used. And there are quite often pieces which are written for one film which we'll use in another, which would be very different if I was saying, well, I'm going to choose a different composer for each project. One doesn't have the huge vocabulary, the, the knowledge of the other music that has been done, of the other images which have been which have been made. And the same with the editor that I work with also has been for many years the same editor. Not just because she is a great editor, but not just because of that, but because of the depth of familiarity with other images, with ways of thinking about the work that is there. All of which speaks to the powerful role of collaboration for you, it seems to me, notwithstanding the artist in the studio alone with his thoughts. Uh, collaboration comes up in so many ways so often. 
I think that, I mean, there is a sine curve of, you know, a sine curve that, of work, which is after spending months, say, making an animated film alone in the studio drawing, it's both fantastic but also essential to work with a group of people on a different project. And even more, after working with a group of people on a project, it's even better to be alone in the studio on one's own right. working again. So there, there, is a, there is a continuing line of being on my own in the studio or being with other people working on. The one thing that doesn't work is to have someone with me while the actual drawing is happening, while the animation happens or while the, the making of a drawing. Um, but I do, I think one of the things I also discovered quite early on is I need to find collaborators who are able to work around me not knowing what I'm doing. The danger of collaborators or the danger of assistants is that you have to pretend you know what you're doing. <laughs> when I first started working in opera and with the magic flute, <coughs> the conductor knew exactly, he'd worked it all out in advance, exactly how the music needed to sound, what the tempi was, what, uh, what decorations were going to be put on, what ornamentations the singers would use. It was all very clear. And in the beginning of rehearsals, the singer would say, well, when do you want me to turn? Where do you want me to go and sit there? And I'd on the spot say, no, no, on this bar you'll go across there, and on that bar you'll go and stand there, and the two of you can look. And it, I got into a panic because I was making it up as I went. And at a certain point, I said, I called all the singers together. And I found I was also painting myself into a corner. I'd have one singer in a corner of the stage and another who I'd carefully shoved to another corner and couldn't get them back together. Um, and I brought the singers together and I said, you have to understand how a drawing happens. You start with a blank sheet of paper and you start making a mark. And then the drawing happens as a conversation or as a reflection between the mark you're making and what you're seeing. And what you've made affects what you see, and that affects what the projection is of the next mark. And that over the course of making the drawing, the drawing is f both formed and found. And in the same way they trust the conductor knowing what he's doing, the singers needed to trust me not knowing. We had six weeks, and at the end of the six weeks, we would know what we were doing. But if they asked me now what they should do at any point, and I gave them an answer, that was the wrong answer. And that we would gradually over the course would find, and so with collaborators in, in all other spheres, whether they're set designers, lighting designers, costume designers, it's essential to, for them to understand that it's an uncertain, slow, backwards and forwards process till we finally arrive at a fixed, finished film production. And when I started with very early collaborations in theatre work, I realised that in almost all cases, I would defer to whoever sounded most certain <laughs> about the decision. I had a long time to realize that the uncertain thoughts that I had in my head were sometimes better than the other certainties. And it became a, a conscious decision to decide I had to find a strategy for uncertainty, to protect it. It's making a safe space for stupidity in a way. I want to change the subject in a way. Um, and talk about this exhibition, which may uh, be the longest running contemporary exhibition in my knowledge, nine stops, this is the ninth stop, four continents, I believe, which speaks to something. And <laughs> there's some obvious things one could say, but what I'm curious about is your experience through all this. Uh, number one, what's been some of the differences between audiences? I mean, you've had lots of shows in the United States at this point, and probably a few in Paris, but what about Vienna and Jerusalem and Moscow? How, what have the reactions been and what surprised you? And, Well, the, I think the truth is that people who really like the exhibition make a point of coming to tell you they really like it. And only very few, there are some, but not that many people who really don't like the exhibition make a point of coming to tell you that too. So that one really, it would be very difficult to judge overall 
I mean, I would have to ask you what people said to you more than what they uh, said to me. It's very difficult when people are looking at the, at the work to judge, are they seeing it very differently? Are they seeing it in the same way? I mean, the, a theater project I once did, which was based on Ubu and the Truth Commission, and that, in a sense, would relate to the Ubu film in the, in the exhibition, which was about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as I described. After we'd shown it in South Africa, we showed it in Weimar in Berlin, and this was in the mid late 1990s. And when we showed it there, someone came up and said, you know, this piece of theater this is fantastic to show here because here we've just been uncovering the Stasi files and who was a spy and who wasn't. So for us, this makes complete sense. But of course, in the rest of Europe, it won't make so much sense. And we went from there to a festival in Zurich where somebody came up and said, you know, here we've been having this whole question about the banks and Nazi gold and Jewish money and where it's been hidden. So for us, it's fantastic to see this piece here, but it's not really going to work for other, for other places. I don't know what people... And in France, somebody said, we've been you know, looking at different collaboration, which no one's spoken about in France before, so it's exactly the right time. So I think that there are a lot of things which started as very local, as very specific to South Africa, but which raise questions, not to say they're universal questions, there are local iterations and versions of those questions with variations in many, many places. And so I think people are very good at latching onto that. I think people are very good at making, understanding context. Even if you don't know Johannesburg and you haven't been there, one imagines a possible Johannesburg from whatever strange clues that one's get. If you think of cities that you've never been to, but still one has a, a maybe completely false, but nonetheless one has a sense of, a, invents a sense of the city from a book you've read, a film you've seen. So in that sense, I have a belief in people's connection. When we showed the exhibition in Moscow with the last theme of the work, which has to do with Gogol and Shostakovich and texts relating to the show trials of the 1930s, I was intrigued and couldn't quite read the audience's reaction. In the lecture I gave there in the performance there, there was a kind of complete silence um, of attention, not of sleeping, but of attention, but not a relaxed laughter there were in other countries, such as when I did it in Sydney on Cockatoo Island a couple of years ago, to the same lecture, where people understood it but had a different set of associations and responses to it. So I think where there is work that's very specifically local, I'm sure people read it in a different way. Part of what inspired me to ask was the specific memory of a funny kind of series of events in Jerusalem before you came where people seemed to want you to take some kind of political stand and they used your work and your presence in some way. No, I think that obviously the work in to show in to show any work in an exhibition in Israel raises a lot of passions and which I can understand and there's a complicated question about boycotts, cultural boycotts or other boycotts which we went through in um, South Africa and on the strength of careful thinking about it, I chose to um, exhibit in Israel much as I abhor the policies of, of that government. Um, but in South Africa there were debates and questions which I took part on in that. In Israel, the people who came to the exhibition were obviously people who wanted to see the work. Um, but I'm certainly, I'm certainly aware of it as, a, as raising questions in different communities. Given your knowledge of Australia, because you've been here a fair amount, and Anne is an Australian, what would you expect uh, the resonances to be from your work to Australian experience? I would hate to presume to talk on your yeah, behalf I, as to what you would... I mean, I think there are, the experience has been that for some people, they really connect to the work, and other people don't, which is... I don't like it, but I understand that that's the case, that not everybody responds to the work. Um, I mean, so every colonial country has a complicated, painful, unresolved past. That's a kind of a given. Whether it's South Africa or Latin America or Australia, 
there are always unsolved questions of questions of land, of heritage, of rights, of disproportions in society. That's that's. I mean, there are. I, I, I suspect there is not any country in the world where this is not the case. It's a question which kind of disappears in certain countries because they've had successful genocides or successful obliterations of uh, of native cultures, not because there were never questions of enormous injustices and different things done. So there are there are questions nagging at every history which can either be looked at or not looked at, which are present or not felt. Um, so I don't think Australia is a particular case in that point, but it's certainly not obviously a tabula rasa uncomplicated um, history or society. So, I mean, I, that may or may not be present when looking at the exhibition. It may completely not be part of what one, of what one sees. I'd like to finish our conversation by asking you to talk about what may be theme six, the next uh, subject you'll be doing a very complicated work in Documenta, which is immediately followed by a related performance. And I wonder if you could uh, give I mean, the I audience thought some it, ideas. I hadn't that. thought about it as uh, anything quite as clear as theme six, but the current project, which has to be finished in the next uh, six weeks or so, um, has different iterations. It exists as a performance piece with a dancer and some singers and musicians on a stage, and also as an installation of different projections, all of which have to do with considerations of time, sort of a history of time. In broad, in broad spheres, a kind of Newtonian, pure, rational time, which disintegrates with multiple times from 1905 onwards, with Einstein's discovery or that in fact time is not the universal constant, um, leading up in a way to the considerations of the black hole, of everything disappearing into the black hole, black holes in space, um, and the end of the projection of, of images. But it's not, I mean, I'm not really interested in the science of time. I'm interested rather in our relationship to it, in particular to our our sense of being caught by a fate, but trying to avoid it. Knowing that in the end, whatever fate is coming towards us will reach us, but trying to behave as if that was not the case, trying to avoid it to change to, to change the world. So I'm, in truth, I'm still at the stage of the project where I couldn't say what it means. I know some of the themes that have come into it. The beginning of it has stopped being a discussion of Newton and has become a recounting of the story of of Perseus. You know the story of Perseus, which is the Perseus's King Acrisius of Argos is told by an oracle that he will be killed by his grandson. So he has Danai, his daughter, locked in a chamber without door or window. But Zeus, the king of the gods, sees Danai and enters the chamber through a chink in the wall as a shower of gold, and he impregnates Danai, and Perseus is born. And the mother and the son are thrown out to the sea, but they don't drown. They're rescued, and Perseus grows into a, to a fit, agile, muscular youth, and he's sent off to kill the Gorgon Medusa, which he does with his reflective shield, and he kills Medusa. And he comes back, and he comes back to forgive his grandfather. He's heard the oracle, the prediction of the oracle, and he's going to forgive his grandfather, and he sets off to sail back to his ancestral home. And at the same time, the aged grandfather, King Acrisius, hears that his grandson is sailing towards his island and is certain Perseus is coming to kill him. And he flees his island disguised as an old man with ashes and sackcloth and goes off to and leaves his island. And just before Perseus arrives at his grandfather's island, he sees or he hears there's an athletics competition at the island of Larissa next door. And he decides he'll take part in the athletics competition, and if he wins the laurel wreath, he will take the laurel wreath as a gift to his grandfather. And he takes part in the discus competition. This is a story I heard when I was about eight. I remember being told the story. 
and he throws the discus and he throws it with such force that it goes past the, all the discuses of his rivals and goes past the edge of the field up into the stands and there on the back row of the stands it strikes and kills an old man in ashes and sackcloth. And as a child and still as a 56 year old adult with a child still inside, that is intolerable. <laughs> Why did the idiot sit in that seat? If just he'd sat one seat to the left or one to the right, it would have all been... Why did Perseus have to show off? If he'd just gone straight to his grandfather, it would have all been fine. So there's something about that sense of the trajectory of that discus. And on the one hand, it's about regret, wanting things to be different but knowing they can't. About wanting to reel time backwards so you can pull the discus back, send the grandfather back home and then let the discus go forward again. So it's about being caught in that pressure. I suppose that's the... That's the impulse, the deep-rooted impulse behind the project that manifests in, in metronomes, in stories about the different attempts to resist time. We promised to end today, and so I thank you all for coming. <laughs>